Uh, thank you all for coming out. It's a pleasure to see you all here today. Uh, and thank you to Eric and uh, the SLICE faculty who extended the invitation to me uh, to do this. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I've, since my so-called retirement um, kicked in at the end of, of last year, I've been, had that opportunity, I guess, in a way to step back and do some more thinking about some of the issues that are confronting libraries. And the PLR study, which Aaron referred to, which I completed after I was off the, um, the PLR executive, uh, was a really interesting opportunity for me to uh, talk to both authors, publishers, and librarians about what's changing with content provision <clears throat> in terms of our current environment. And trust me, there are huge, huge changes underway, and we're just sort of seeing the tip of the iceberg. And how, the, how those changes impact programs like public lending, right? And, and if we have enough time, I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, I think my title, the title for my talk should have been Stay Calm and Carry On. I think that's the correct historical reference to the, the British uh, poster that came out during the, um, the Second World War. And the, the freak out and throw stuff is a New York uh, attitude uh, sort of transformation of that. I was in New York in the lead up to Hurricane Irene in August, and um, it seemed most appropriate, right, for how things, uh, how things were playing out there. But for me, it, it sort of, and I thought it was a cute saying, freak out and throw stuff. So I was looking for an opportunity to use it, and this talk came up, so there you go. So I, I can move on now. I've been able to do that. Uh, but it does, uh, what I was trying to capture, obviously, is the fact that um, there are some very worrying things happening out there uh, in terms, worrying in terms of the potential impact for our traditional services. And uh, we really do need to, I think, spend a lot of time uh, thinking about those things uh, and without panicking or without necessarily just staying calm, <laughs> we need to position ourselves to, to really uh, assist our institutions make the necessary transitions for what is coming. And I'm very pleased to see a number of students here uh, today because I think it is the students, the people who are in school right now, the people who will be graduating soon, who are going to be guiding these changes uh, for us. And essentially, the future of our institutions, no pressure, is in your hands, right, as we start to, to work some of this stuff out. Um, there's one of the things that I've learned, and it's, it's sort of, I'm probably going to say some things that seem self-evident, right, so excuse me for, for sort of stating the obvious. But I, for a number of years, have been emphasizing um, with uh, professional staff that I've been talking to that, in essence, there shouldn't be any barriers between moving across type of library employment. And I think we're seeing increasing number of examples of this where, uh, where staff are very successfully transitioning from public to academic to special in what you, whatever sequence you might like to uh, sketch out. And I think that's entirely appropriate and, and, and will continue. What's interesting to me, however, is that when we start talking about the future of libraries and start sketching out uh, where things are going, that in fact there are some very significant dichotomies uh, between types of libraries in terms of how they're probably going to have to position themselves to deal with um, what is coming. So, and th part of this has, uh, relates to what, I, what, what Aaron alluded to that I've been working on, uh, and I'm just one of a number of people working uh, with uh, IFLA on a draft treaty on library limitations and exceptions for consideration by the World Intellectual Property Organization. And what came home to me is that the needs of libraries in that kind of context um, are very different if you're looking at it from the perspective of an academic library, research library, or if you're looking at it from the perspective of a public library. So we'll talk a bit about that. The other dichotomy, which I think is intensifying, is the whole issue about libraries in developed countries and libraries under, underdeveloped and developing countries and what their needs are in terms of legislative protections for their ability to carry out their functions. And for me, this, it's just been very interesting to see this play out. And is it possible, a rhetorical question, is it possible for us to come up with regulatory regimes that effectively address the needs of all of these different types of libraries, uh, libraries in different um, settings? I'm going to focus my comments largely on public libraries because that's where my experience and background is. Um, so I apologize for that. I will be making some allusions to uh, post-secondary 
uh, libraries, uh, but I don't claim to be an expert to the extent that I claim to be an expert on anything. Um, we are increasingly dealing with what I would describe as um, public library skeptics, people who are questioning the ongoing viability of our institutions. Um, and usually, recently anyway, this questioning has focused on the content side of the equation. And in simplistic terms, it comes down to we have the internet now, what do we need the library for? Uh, and, and that's, you know, it, it sort of morphs at a certain point then into the economic issue. Um, if we don't need the library, why are we spending all this money uh, when we're under significant pressure and, and things are going on? So that's one part of it and the one thing that we have to deal with moving forward. And there are, there are some truths in some of the concerns that are raised and we need to be realistic about addressing those and figuring out how, how we move forward. For others, and I think a prime example would be the Rob Ford uh, regime in Toronto, there are ideological concerns which come to play as well. So irrespective of, of the library's effectiveness in terms of delivering content uh, in the digital environment, the question becomes, we need to reduce government costs, we need to get rid of frills, and culture probably is a frill, and certainly libraries look like it, and uh, so it becomes part of this cost-cutting cost regime that plays out. Um, and I would differentiate that, that sort of mindset very much from some bureaucrats and politicians and library leaders who are having to deal with some very diff difficult issues because the money runs out. At that point, it's not ideological. You're just dealing with, uh, as in the case now is starting, with some alarming frequency to occur in the United States, uh, for example, municipal governments that are going bankrupt. And uh, when you look at the data with respect to, for example, pension liabilities for a number of US states and uh, US public sector employers, it is very, very scary stuff. And uh, how, how do we manage this? And how do we defend our service uh, moving forward in that kind of context? So it's going to start off by talking about the content skeptics. Now, this is not new. In the early 1990s, uh, when the move was underway for Vancouver to get approval to build its new main library, uh, which ultimately opened in 1995, there was a, an author and uh, self-proclaimed futurologist named Frank Ogden uh, in Vancouver. I don't know if anybody remembers Dr. T Dr. Tomorrow, I think was his, his uh, branding. Uh, and he was a very, very active advocate against funding the construction of this new library building, which was at that point, I think, apart from the Canby Street Bridge, going to be the single most expensive capital project the city had ever undertaken. And, uh, you know, in the well over $100 million in, in early 1990s dollars. And Ogden's argument was, very soon we will be able to have the contents of the Library of Congress in a suitcase, you know, on all these microchips, and what are we building this thing for, right? And that was an argument which um, arose, which the library officials of the day had to address and try and, uh, and thank goodness they were successful in doing so in ensuring that people understood that, that the library played both many diverse roles, but also that what Ogden was talking about was not in the offing at all. So there's an underlying principle, I guess, which I find myself turning back to uh, more frequently, and that is that when it comes to technology, we tend to overestimate the short-term implications of what's going on, and we tend to underestimate the long-term implications. So, and, so, and I, I think there is a lot of truth to that. So what Ogden was talking about in his day, uh, it just wasn't going to happen in the, in the 15 plus years since that building opened. And in fact, now it is the most heavily used civic facility, continues to be the most heavily used civic facility in the city of Vancouver, and, uh, and maintains robust and heavily used collections, uh, irrespective of everything that has happened in the interim. And obviously, the, the internet as we know it happened in the interim. The internet was not really on the radar when that building was designed. And I think it's to the credit of the people who were involved in the design at that time that it was, it was as effective as it was in terms of accommodating the changes that took place. 
But I think that, so that's something we have to guard against. We have to guard against sort of saying, oh my God, the sky is falling, it's all gonna change tomorrow. We have to throw all of this stuff out or we have to do this or we have to do that. But on the other hand, we better prepare, be prepared for what the situation is 10 years down the road when quite likely we are going to see some very, very different uh, scenarios playing out. And in the PLR report I did, I, I came across a number of different people in very different contexts who used the metaphor of e-books uh, comparing it to the early days of the Model T, right? That, that nobody at the point that, that Henry Ford launched the Model T from the assembly line could predict the impact the automobile was going to have on society, on our, our physical landscape and, and on um, just our, our way of living and, and change so many things. And the, the sense, the strong sense is that with e-books, we just don't know yet. But I think we can be reasonably assured there are going to be some profound societal changes that emerge uh, as content distribution significantly, you know, continues to move towards, in, and we'll talk a bit about this too, in sort of escalating rate, moves towards digital. Um, what exactly are going to be the societal implications of what are going to be the implications for our institutions? And that's what I think as a student today is really exciting, right? In terms of charting that and figuring out how, how, how this is going to play out. So, um, massive change is underway. I'd like to spend a bit of time here just quoting from an article that Peter Ladner published in August. And you know, many of you probably didn't, haven't been around Vancouver that much. A number of you will have been. Peter Ladner was the mayoralty candidate for the nonpartisan association in the last civic election almost three years ago. Is an influential, um, I would say, public intellectual. Uh, and, uh, and politician, clearly, in, in this um, community, was the founder of uh, Business in Vancouver, the publication. And he wrote uh, in a column uh, a, a matter of, of two months ago, uh, and, and just hold, hold your groans as I read this, or we'll, we'll, we'll deconstruct it afterwards, okay, when we go through it. But he wrote, he wrote quote, next up, libraries on the e-cusp. How much longer can libraries escape the fate of video rental stores, photo printing stores, encyclopedias, print newspapers, and bookstores? The interesting, uh, the print newspapers is an interesting inclusion. I, I don't quite know. I mean, we know newspaper circulation is suffering, but they're still doing, relatively speaking, okay. Uh, to continue, Toronto City Council has included library shutdowns in a list of proposed cuts to make up a $774 million budget deficit. There is a predictable uproar, but libraries as repositories of reference books are no longer necessary. Reference books are no longer necessary. They're all online, at the end of a click, in an instant, at no cost. Groan, right? Um, <laughs> Amazon's ebook sales overtook printed book sales almost two years ago. Libraries as dispensers, I, that's not true by the way, but they, they have overtaken it, but it wasn't that, that long ago. Libraries as dispensaries of ebooks are an elaborate extravagance given the space required for ebook contents, in parenthesis, none. Libraries are evolving into necessary places for, for going online at no cost to find out things to read on screen, but their signature role as keepers of free access to print literature and public information has disappeared. As, heavens, as havens for equal access to the internet, quiet places for learning and reading, and lingering, a luxury resource for those like me who insist on printed books, they serve a noble purpose. But that role doesn't include warehousing the thousands of books that no one needs or reads anymore. Uh, Toronto is right to be questioning the value of library budgets in this new e-world. Vancouver should be doing the same. Now, um, and we've had, when, when uh, Peter Ladner was on council, he was chair of the finance committee uh, for several years, and we had spent, a, this is not a new view on his part, and uh, he obviously has, has, is hung up on this whole issue about libraries as purveyors of information and, and what that means. Um, so the reference role has fundamentally changed. We need to acknowledge that. Um, it hasn't disappeared, there is still a place for it. Um, and there in part, uh, and this is one of the things that we talk about, is the whole issue about libraries' ability to serve the marginalized and those in our society who are not 
uh, don't have access to either the, the finances or, or the infrastructure in their, own, in their own living circumstances to be able to access things, and there's clearly an important role for libraries there. But this issue about no cost is, is this myth that, that's emerged and, and is out there. And uh, the library board chair of Vancouver wrote a letter in response to this column uh, pointing out some of the proprietorial and expensive databases that Vancouver was licensing and making available to the residents of the, um, of the city. And clearly that role continues. Uh, there's no question, however, reference service over the last 20 years is probably our service that has changed the most. Uh, and from the point of view of patron convenience and so on, there's, you cannot argue that the, change, that, that the changes have been bad. Uh, for me, uh, doing research now on areas such as publishing industry statistics, government reports, whatever, I don't need the library. And, th and that's a fact, right? I, I have, you know, I like to think it's probably illusion, self-illusion, delusion. I think I have certain skills, right, in terms of being able to do subject searching and so on. But, uh, and many people don't. But at the end of the day, the information is out there and, and a lot of the information is out there and people can't get to it. So that's something we need to... Um, you know, be, be conscious of as we defend this role, that it is nuanced, it's not, you know, man the barricades and protect reference service the way it was even 10 years ago. The other myth is that print is dead. Um, and this, I want to talk a bit about this because it seems to me it's, it's really interesting right now because there's no question that there is a seismic shift that's underway. And that shift is, can be, the length of time it's been taking place. Now I'm talking about, and this is where I have to sort of the dichotomy between academic libraries and public libraries. For academic libraries, it happened a while ago. For public libraries though, it essentially really started playing out seriously, probably in the lead up to Christmas 2010. And the wide dissemination of ebook readers that took place at that time, uh, and the move towards um, a much greater embrace of uh, digital for recreational reading and for trade, trade e-books. Uh, and this is escalating at a rate right now, which I would describe as alarming for those of us who have um, certain vested feelings for conventional publishing, <laughs> right? Um, and I had the experience, I've been uh, attending writers festival events for the last couple of days and was at the opening reception yesterday and was talking with two esteemed Canadian publishers of my generation. And uh, it's really grim out there right now. Uh, and we need to always call, I mean, it's, it's always been grim in publishing, right? You understand this, that Robert Fulford had this great quote where he said, the, the, the mantra of the Canadian publisher is, things are bad, they're about to get worse, and then they'll get truly dreadful. Right? And they've been saying that for like 25, 30 years, right? This is the way it is. It's the nature of, of that business. But the concerns that are being voiced today, I think, are incrementally much more substantive than have been encountered before. And I'll just cite just a couple of snapshot statistics just to give you a sense of the shift that's happening. So when you're talking about trade book sales in North America, probably the appropriate word to describe what's happening right now is collapse. Um, in May 2011, in the United States, adult hardcover sales were down 38.2%. That is huge. Uh, trade paperback sales were down 14.3%, and mass market paperback sales were down 39.4%. Now, this has profound implications for the whole infrastructure that, that surrounds the notion of publishing, distribution, and reading. Um, we're well aware, particularly in this city, about the problems of, of book retailing. Uh, this city is, I would argue, perhaps one of the most underserved in North America in terms of having quality independent bookstores right now. And why that is, it's, it's a really interesting question. We could have that, maybe save that for the question period. But you compare Vancouver to Victoria, Seattle, Portland, uh, they all have better independent bookstores than we'd have, much more extensive independent bookstores. And I, I think there are some reasons for that, but, but this is before. I mean, you know, it started to erode in Vancouver before this stuff started playing out. And now people are routinely talking about the fact that there are going to be significant business failures 
or uh, sort of forced mergers within trade, commercial trade publishing and that those are going to start playing out sooner rather than later and that the landscape is going to change profoundly. Um, what's interesting for the public library is print is still the cornerstone of our use, right, in terms of you look at all the use data. And in fact, for public libraries, we are likely to be one of the, the last places that the shift will take place fully. And when I talk about the change taking place fully, I'm unclear, I mean, we're probably talking 20 years, right? Uh, but in the study that I did on um, PLR for eBooks and so on, the PLR Commission was very much so. Public lending right is a program, just the capsule summary, that compensates writers of broadly defined literary work, Canadian writers of, of literary work, uh, compensates them for, for the presence of their books in Canadian public libraries. And writers tend to, uh, they can get, for each library that holds a an eligible title uh, of 10 sampled libraries, they get $10, or sorry, $40 a year. So for a library who's published a number, of, uh, for a, an author who has published a number of books, uh, and that those books are popular and held by public libraries, this can constitute a fairly substantial annual revenue flow of, you know, low thousands of dollars. Um, Judy, you must be... How much do you get? Well, when I for, uh, 10 years ago, I got 700 dollars a year. Now it's down to 300. Uh, those pesky libraries keep those drawing Those pesky libraries, books. They, they, um, the, if I bring some new books, out, it'll go up. Yeah. But that's, um, yeah, the writers I know uh, rely on that. Tremendous. Yeah, it's, it's not indispensable. Or it, 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 yeah, it, it, it is, uh, it, it's significant. And obviously the PLR Commission is very concerned about, because they're seeing what's happening broadly speaking with the publishing trends, and wrestling with the issue about should eBooks be eligible for public lending right compensation? And, and how would that play out if, if, if that were, were introduced? Um, and that raises a whole range of really interesting questions, uh, such as uh, what is a book? What is a loan? <laughs> you know, and these things are all up for question now. And when you look at it in the Canadian context, a book is defined in the Copyright Act as printed material. Uh, so an e-book is not a book under the law of the land. Uh, in Europe, the decision has been made with respect to public lending right that e-books are not lent, they're telecommunicated. An entirely different regulatory regime. Uh, the types of e-books uh, that we're dealing with, e-pub versus PDF, um, in PDF, which is the CRK, CRK, some of you may be aware of the CRKM license with, for post-secondary libraries of the 8,000 plus, now it's growing, um, social science and humanities monographs that was licensed for libraries, including UBC. Those, that, what, what is a loan? Because essentially it's stream content. It's like going to a web page. Um, and the use data is reported in page views. Uh, and this becomes hugely problematic when you translate this to funding programs that are predicated on the old way of doing business. So anyway, that's a bit, a bit of a sidebar. But the issue about what is a loan is, is hugely important for us in some ways because this is where I think I would point to the biggest dichotomy between academic and public libraries. For academic libraries, scholarly publishers, the academic library is the market. And yes, it's been difficult, and yes, there's been a lot of tension, but you know, you can't, you may not, and sometimes you may not be able to live with each other, but you absolutely can't live without each other. I mean, we can set aside Creative Commons and those things, which over time will start perhaps to, to, to move things towards an ability to live without uh, for-profit scholarly publishers. But at the end of the day, libraries are the market. For public libraries and trade publishers who provide the bulk of our content, we are an afterthought. We are not the market. And in fact, for the majority of those publishers and many authors, we're seen to be a threat to their business model. So, and that is why we have a situation today where a number of trade publishers in North America are refusing to license eBooks for library lending. Now this is, from my, I, I say this and I believe this to be the case, the first time in history that we have a situation where libraries are not able to provide otherwise commercially available books to our users. 
This has never come up before. And the reason for that is the first sale doctrine, or what is referred to as exhaustion. So you have, which are sort of, it's both common law and in some copyright acts, it's actually enshrined in law. When somebody sells the physical object, they forego certain rights to the use of that object. Now, they still, under copyright, maintain the right to, to reproduce it, um, to perform it, to do a number of things. There's still rights that it hurt, but they cannot control reselling. They cannot control destroying. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of things that you can do. Uh, and and, and that, it's what allows uh, secondhand bookstores to exist. It's what allows libraries to exist. And those rights don't exist with ebooks. Ebooks are licensed. Um, with Overdrive, the largest single supplier to the, well, I would argue for trade books, probably the only major supplier to public libraries right now, a, a US uh, corporate entity, um, the book, the, con the, the library licenses access for its users to the ebooks. The library never possesses the ebook file. Essentially, what they're doing is licensing the ability for our users to access the Overdrive servers to download to their handhelds for a limited period of time under very strict um, terms and conditions. So, you know, we, we just we don't physically possess the item. And if we ever cease doing business with Overdrive, although nominally we're purchasing these titles in perpetuity, if we stop dealing with Overdrive, we don't have access anymore. They're gone. So th these are all troubling, troubling uh, issues. So it's all about loss of control. And one of the things that I found really interesting in the, in the PLR study was that every sector is experiencing this. Authors are spooked because they feel they've lost control. They see the example of the music industry and what happened to creators there, where the sort of the content escaped and started undermining uh, revenue streams for creators. Publishers are feeling hugely vulnerable with justification right now. And libraries are feeling vulnerable, particularly public libraries, I would argue, because of this, you know, for the first time in our history, we are getting complaints from our users about our collections for, on things that we can do nothing about. Now, we always used to get complaints about our collection, you know. <laughs> Why didn't you buy this book? Why didn't you buy more copies of this book? Why did you buy this book, right? These complaints would come in, and, and you know, you could respond, and you could change, you know, you could, you could act on that. Now, when somebody complains, why don't you have this ebook? Chances are pretty good we don't have it because the, the, the rights holder is not licensing its availability to us. What do you mean only one person at a time can access this electronic file when that's you know, clearly not necessary given the technology? Well, that's the terms and conditions under which it was licensed to, it, to us. So these are, these are factors where we're sort of really struggling in ways, I think, right now. And a lot of what's happening is about communication with uh, primarily publishers at this stage, but also to a certain extent with authors, around um, trying to set their minds at rest that there are viable licensing models that will address their concerns and allow public libraries to continue to fulfill their roles. Um, but this is by no means assured, and we still have major companies who are, as I said, refusing to license to public libraries because they don't feel they're protected. And the argument that the publishers use, and authors as well, is that for, it's, it's really interesting because they perceive the, the digital file remains perfect. Uh, the libraries have the ability to disseminate that digital file in ways that will under, undermine geographic markets. In other words, they, they absolutely will not countenance interlibrary loan with respect to these digital files because it comes down to the only thing, you know, buy one and, you know, I never sell another book again, right? And so we need to talk about these things. We need to take a number of the licensing models that have emerged over the years with respect to, um, you know, journal content in, in academic and public libraries where you use variable metrics to arrive at fair pricing. Um, and that could be the size of your service population uh, the length of the license, there's a number, you know, number of simultaneous users. There's all these variables, all of which can be linked to pricing. And hopefully we can arrive at a situation where um, we can see um, a situation emerge that, in fact, libraries can continue to fulfill their role with, ter with respect to content uh, provision. In the interim, there is 
I think, some vulnerability around this whole issue about the content skeptics and, and the ability. So it's not just that we don't really need public libraries to make e-books available, but guess what? In a number of instances, public libraries can't make the e-books available, and that's a real concern. Um, Carolyn Wood, who's the executive director of the Association of Canadian Publishers, said a very funny thing. I thought it was funny. Uh, when she was explaining why publishing had been slow, so slow to move into the digital uh, age compared with film, music, and, and other media. And what she said was, well, you have to remember that publishing is an industry that has undergone 1.5 format changes in 600 years. And that 0.5 was paperbacks, right? Um, and when you think about music, and you know, there has been a constant cycle of different formats, different ways of dissemination, going back to the piano roll and Stephen Foster lobbying US Congress to try and prevent the sale of piano rolls because it was going to undermine live performance. Right? So that, you know, and that tension has always existed. But for publishing, um, slow to, to get in the game, but now they're there and they're really scrambling, I think, to try to figure out how to manage this. Uh, and I really worry about the ability of conventional publishers for whom we as libraries who still have large demand for print are, are very dependent upon um, their ability to prosper in an environment where they're vulnerable to startup companies that are going to just start dealing with digital only content, don't have to worry about the whole production side, warehousing, distribution, all of those types of things. Um, and this, this brings us in part to Amazon and what Amazon has been up to lately. Uh, and there's been a lot of excitement about Amazon. There was a, an article in the New York Times earlier this week about Amazon's publishing program. So Amazon's intent is to control the development, the production, the sale, and the device to which the, the content is sold to, to, to control the whole chain, right? And they have now struck, they've hired, hired Larry Kirschbaum, who's big name, New York publisher, uh, very well established, major trade publisher. He is overseeing Amazon's new publishing program. They are aggressively um, signing authors away from conventional publishers. And they are going to be increasingly developing their own content. And working both with authors who are self-publishing, in quotation marks, but also as an imprint, developing their own content. And this is sort of from the, the they, they've by and large really undermined retail book selling. You know, it, was, it, it took a while, but it's, it's there. First, retail book selling has changed profoundly since 1995 in Canada anyway, when the chain, when Chapters and Indigo launched the big box bookstores, we, we tend to forget how fairly recent in our history these, these happenings are. First it was the big box bookstores, and then it was the online and Amazon. And when uh, the bookstore on 4th Avenue opened up at Dira, it was it started, you know, the former Duthie staff. Um, it was initially Sitka and then became Adira. And a lot of people were wondering, how can this work in this environment where you're selling, I mean, you had knowledgeable staff, uh, a very good stock, but selling at list price. Uh, and when anybody knows that you can go to Amazon.ca and get it at 38% off list price, and Amazon.ca is pretty good about the, with their, you know, the, the, the metrics they use in terms of recommendations and so on are pretty, pretty good, uh, relatively speaking. So it seemed at that point a quixotic endeavor, and it lasted less than a year. Uh, blockbuster. Um, you know, we're seeing all this retail space, you know, thou tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of square feet of re square meters of retail space opening up in Canada as a result of Blockbuster shutting down. And this raises a concern for libraries, for public libraries particularly, um, because um, we have been able to demonstrate they were still heavily used and we still circulate a lot of material. Part of that over the last probably 15 years has been driven by what I refer to as the AV bubble. A lot of it has to do with DVDs. Initially, video cassettes, DVDs turned out to be much more amenable to the library environment in some ways. Not always, but in some ways. And that, um, 
that bubble very well could burst, right? And the biggest threat probably is that the producers will stop producing physical, physical you know, audiovisual uh, content and everything will move to streaming and that will, you know, realistically might take place over a relatively short period of time. Well, it's, it's in Vancouver Public Library now it's approximately 16% of total circulation. Um, print, over the last 10 years, print circulation at the library has been declining. It's, it's not a dramatic decline, but it's steady. It's sort of 1.5 to 2% a year and you just sort of see it slipping and you, you sort of start doing the longer term protections and you sort of say, okay, where are we going with this and, and how is this going to play out? And to what extent can content remain central to, to us fulfilling, fulfilling our role? Um, I'll just give you a quote from, um, from Am Amazon um, where I think it, it, it echoes, it's echoes some stuff I've said before and I think a lot of people are, are realizing that this is the case. Uh, the, the New York Times quoted uh, Russell uh, Grandinetti, an Amazon top executive. He first off, this whole thing about publishers always predicting the worst. Grandinetti said, it's always the end of the world when it comes to publishers. You can set your watch by it. Um, and then he, he, the Times continued. He pointed out that the landscape was in some ways changing for the first time since Gutenberg invented the modern book nearly 600 years ago. So that comes up again. Quote, the only really necessary people in the publishing process now are the writer and the reader. Everyone who stands between those two has both risk and opportunity. And that's the library. The library's in there. Um, I think the, the most vulnerable sector clearly is book retailing, brick and mortar book retailing. Um, and libraries and publishers, I think, are going to be scrambling as this moves forward. I was at a presentation um, by Y.S. Chin who is the new president of the International Publishers Association. And he's interesting because IPA is an organization which has largely been dominated by scholarly publishing. And he said uh, that, um, you know, we will never be, referring to publishing, we will never be in stasis again. We're in for a marathon. Publishers are preparing for different roles. And I think that's, that's really important. Uh, and he stated as well, the role of intermediaries are becoming um, more indistinct. Um, now, what about the economy? Okay, I'll, I'll wrap up with just talking a bit about the economy. What happens when the money runs out? Well, we have lots of examples of that. Um, probably going no further than looking south to California. San Jose Public Library has, I believe it's two brand new public library branches that were constructed but never opened because they didn't have the operating funding. So they sort of sit behind, continue to sit behind fences. In England, we're seeing situations where um, clearly councils, there was just a court ruling in England last week where the courts ruled that councils had the right to close, it was one council that was challenged legally, was closing 20% of its branch libraries. Uh, this, um, you know, it's, we're okay for now <laughs> in Canada. Uh, it's unclear how long that will, um, will continue to be the case. Uh, part of the danger I think we're facing is that there are very different visions about what our role is and what our place is and you don't necessarily be wanting to have those debates when the money gets really tight. <laughs> you need to be pretty sure about where you're going and what this looks like. And uh, part of this um, I think has to involve uh, paying more than lip service to collaboration. I don't think we've been particularly good at that uh, in the past. Uh, I was a Jim Neal, um, a very influential U.S. Uh, librarian, uh, treasurer of the American Library Association and head of Columbia University Library, uh, referred to the last 20 years in academic libraries in North America as the age of decadence. And he said, the age of decadence is over. <laughs> we can't continue to operate the way we have. He and Cornell University, I don't have people heard about Too Cool? I don't know how new this is to people. Really interesting collaboration between two major academic research libraries in the state of New York, launching a, a project called Too Cool, Too C-O-L, you know, Columbia Cornell. Um, and uh, what they are doing is they've essentially established an arm's length third body, which is going to, has an AUL heading it up, is going to employ staff who work for both agencies, for both universities. 
and looking at much more systematic division of labor with respect to collection development. Um, the, the whole notion about finding aids and access and how that takes place. I think it's a really interesting uh, model, but, and that was triggered by double digit budget cuts to those institutions and you're okay, what, what are we being forced to do here? And I think those are the kinds of challenges we're going to face. And I think from the point of view of the public library, we need to think about archives, city archives and how, and we've already had this discussion in, in Vancouver, it's unclear how it's going to play out, but you have two civic agencies both funded directly by the city that have historical photograph collections that are doing digitization. In some ways, very different mandates, and we understand that. But in other ways, the service clientele is the same, and we're sort of forcing them to bounce between Vanier Park and downtown Vancouver if they're looking for historical photographs. Um, you know, it's not, it doesn't make a lot of logic. The, the other difficult one is school libraries and public libraries and how that starts to play out. Um, I've been quoted in the past as saying not having great optimism with respect to the future of school libraries and how that is going to, to play out simply because they're pawns in a political game where they have no control. And uh, so we'll, we'll see. But increasingly now, I think we're going to have public libraries within the Ministry of Education in this province. There's going to be an increased expectation that there will be some more coordinated and, and systematic um, collaboration moving forward. So I think that in some ways the status quo is not an option. There will be municipal imperatives, which will both political and bureaucratic, uh, which are going to drive us to move uh, towards more strategic uh, collaboration. The labor relations issues are going to be very significant, and we have to partner, I, I think, with, with our unions in a way that uh, serves the, the greater good in terms of our institutions and try and find outcomes that, uh, that do ensure that continuing um, success of our institutions. And the status quo is probably not going to be an option, would my, be my guess, in, in, the, in the medium term. Our values, I'm, I'm wrapping up here, our values have to be uh, preserved as we do this. We do think, bring certain things to the table which I think are unique in, in the municipal context. Values about intellectual freedom, about the primacy we place on early childhood learning. Um, uh, the widely available access to information and culture in a kind of non culture using the term non-hierarchically, right, non-judgmentally, but also to do that in a way as inclusive and ensures that all in our society have uh, the way forward. And the, the Occupy Vancouver and other protests, I mean, I, I believe the biggest gap in our society is the gap between the rich and poor. And that's the, the biggest challenge that, that we're facing. And the public library is, is positioned, I think, to assist with some of that anyway. Um, so remember, we overestimate the short-term impact, underestimate the longer-term impact. Um, I think the graduates of today uh, are going to be central to ensuring the successful transition of our institutions as we, um, as we move forward. And um, I think the services, helping our institutions and our services adapt to the new realities that we're, we're going to be um, facing. So I think I will conclude with that. Um, I hope we have a chance to do a bit of, you know, have, if there are follow-up questions, I'd be delighted to try and answer those. And, and this is sort of just, I think, you know, from my perspective and my own mind, just the sort of beginning of a dialogue and trying to sort these things out and see how it starts to, um, how it starts to play out moving forward. So is there anything that I said that people radically disagree with? I just think it's totally off the wall. What is he thinking, right? He's losing it already. He's only been retired for eight months. <laughs> well, thank you. Very much. <laughs> we do about ten minutes for questions. Yes, Karen. Uh, well, let me ask you one question. Um, when I hear, you hear from publishers and everybody says how terrible it is that the price of a book has dropped in the close of the bookstores, but can we make an argument that the price so, of the drop in the price of books actually allows more people to, to own the books, to buy the books, to uh, have access to the information? There is an argument that says that. Right now, the significant price drops have all been with digital, uh, from my perspective. I'm back now. <coughs> I bought a hardcover collection of short stories the other day. It was $32. Doesn't seem that cheap, you know, hardcover. <coughs> so that, I don't think that's changed. But when you're buying 
you know, e-books for half the price of the, the print alternative, that clearly does a result, hopefully, in what, I mean, this is the big debate. I mean, do e-book sales cannibalize print sales, or is there a new market that starts emerging? And in fact, are we going to sell more books? And in fact, the evidence is that they probably are selling more books right now, but the price point is lower, so the revenue is lower. And at the end of the day, it's about sustainable business models. And the authors, and those of you, I mean, I noticed there was a stack of the latest issue of BC Book World in, in, in the Slays area, up, the common area upstairs. And if you read that, particularly that one page where um, the authors are, uh, have, hold, hold forth on uh, their concerns about e-books, I, I think in some ways it's a sort of unfortunate position. I, I don't agree with some of the things that are being put forward. I think digital is the way of the future, and you got, you know, you know, get on, get on the train or get run over in some ways. I don't think there's, there's much doubt about that's how it's going to play out. But um, I do agree that authors need a fair shake. Uh, but there's also got to be sustainable business models. So there are all these arguments. So just as we're arguing with publishers about what, what are reasonable licensing and fair licensing terms and conditions for e-books, um, the authors are very upset about royalty rates, uh, royalty rates on a reduced list price, uh, and the, certainly the author's position, it's not, I think, fully defensible, but the author's position is that publishers make more money with e-books and authors make less. Um, that's unclear, I think, is how, what I would say. Um, so yes, there is, there is the possibility that it might result in, in wider dissemination. Clearly, the, we're going to see new models emerge, publish, authors publishing themselves, Free content is probably going to be more important as we move forward. So moving from the scholarly publishing, utilizing Creative Commons, open access protocols, to um, writers who are doing very well by producing trade novels, making them available at a very low cost point in, uh, in electronic form, finding huge audiences, and then being able to lever that into a very successful uh, career in writing. I, I would love to hear uh, your thoughts on um, how long your service to marginalized populations will change or has changed. When a really good example was the presentation to the boards by a 14 year old in Toronto who explained that uh, after bursting into tears at 3 a.m. that she didn't have a place to work, she only came to the library, she couldn't, her family could not afford a computer. Uh, she needed the computer, she needed the space, she needed this for her entire future. Um, she was very eloquent uh, for a 14 year old and um, the assumption is that the population, especially of the young, but also an older population has both space for uh, research, has research tools, has electronic access. So the divide between the digital rich and the digital yeah. And a lot of this, I mean, part of the arguments that will emerge is you've got, you know, cities funding community centers, cities funding neighborhood houses, cities funding libraries, and the, the physical space, the, the public space issue is hugely important. What libraries bring to the table is principles relating to inclusion, intellectual freedom, and ideally um, much less likely to impose barriers that are either fee-based or uh, barriers based on behavior or appearance or other things, which quite often do come up, for want of a better phrase, in more middle class services. Um, I think that it's a very persuasive argument for the library that we do play this, this, this leveling role. Uh, however, I think if that's, all we're, if that's the only clientele that we serve, we've also got a problem in terms of our, our revenue streams, the percentage of budgets that are dedicated to us. Um, the issues, that there's huge issues that are going to be playing out with respect to um, early childhood development, early childhood literacy. Uh, I'm going to be really interesting to see, interested to see the impact of all-day kindergarten uh, on library services, extending kindergarten back. I mean, though, though that was a core constituency for us, right? When they were in daycares or with their parents or whatever, and, and now they, that, that constituency may not be available anymore. So. One thing, I, parenthetically, one thing I will say, I think that the public library is better positioned than either school libraries or academic libraries in the short to medium term politically. 
because we can make those kinds of arguments. And it is, don't kid yourself, it's political. And there was a wonderful Gable cartoon um, in September in the Globe and Mail of Rob Ford in a, in a pink t-shirt. Did anybody see this? In a pink t-shirt that said, save our libraries and sniffing a flower at the, at the helm of this Viking battleship, right? And the barbarian hordes behind them and one of them leaning forward and saying, there's been a change in strategy, yes? <laughs> right? But you get that kind of political pressure that forces change and public libraries are much better positioned to do that than university libraries in my belief. Um, if the provost decides that his biggest problem is space for faculty offices, um, you know, that could become an issue for the, the, the library if there's a lot of space devoted to, to use OCLC's terms, heritage print collections. Um, and the school library, as, as I've alluded to before, I, I believe has no power. And ultimately now caught up in the kind of province-wide negotiating where all of the issues relate, appear to relate to things like class size and so on, that the, the, the school-based library is inevitably increasingly marginalized. So I think public libraries are much better positioned to influence their short and medium term uh, survival and outcome. Um, I'd be in an academic library, that's a subject for another talk, I guess, about how well academic libraries will be able to uh, defend um, their role when uh, collection development is increasingly national, <laughs> um, when, uh, you know, study halls, right, and how much of the collection is actually used and how much space is allocated to those. And that's a hugely, I mean, it's a complex argument. I'm not arguing for shipping all the collections off to storage, just maybe some of them. But. We're coming up to 1 o'clock. Yeah, sorry, yeah, one more. Oh, maybe it's actually kind of closely related to Judith's comment, but thinking about these content critics arguing that yeah. we need these spaces, it's all online, it just seems like a very narrow view. Mm -hmm. What do they think is going to happen to all those really critical programs like youth literacy or maybe public libraries a space for community engagement, bringing people together for larger conversations? Like, yeah. What do you think that's yeah. Kind of where they start to go? One of the challenges that the library faces is that, relatively speaking, within our communities, we're an expensive solution to delivering some of these services. Um, one of the real epiphanies for me that occurred in my time as a city librarian in Vancouver is we were arguing with city council to get funding for five outreach children's librarians. So children's librarians who weren't anchored specifically in a specific branch and were out uh, reaching kids where kids were most vulnerable in, in their communities and so on. Some of the most difficult criticism to deal with from that proposal came from the childcare community and came from other people who we are aligned with totally uh, on issues relating to uh, early childhood development. And their argument was, um, and it's, it, it's a tricky argument because they also box themselves in because they argue their salary levels are too low. On the other hand, they're saying, you know, you're paying a librarian 25, hour, 25 you know, dollars an hour to do a mother goose program. Well, guess what? We can do that for half. Um, so you end up with those kinds of arguments too, where I think you have to be very strategic about where you devote your resources and how you position it and who you partner with. So, and I know, looking over Judy, I know all the arguments about the value add that librarians bring to the process and so on, uh, and that those were used, and in this case were used successfully. Um, but yes, the libraries do fulfill a lot of really important uh, functions, and those arguments can successfully be made uh, if the money gets tight, are we the most cost-effective way to do that? And that's one of the things I think we have to get our mind around and consider. Yeah, I have a question about uh, allocating the responses that you just touched upon. And um, given the green landscape that we're looking at, do you think there is a, a, a renewal and even um, more important role for allocating resources for special collections and archives in public libraries? I've, I've been a huge supporter of special collections at Vancouver Public Library and successfully fundraised for things like um, fine press books published in British Columbia that, to ensure that those were available for digitizing historical photographs and so on. So I think there is clearly an important role to be played there. I think increasingly that's the kind of service where it probably needs to be more collaborative. Um, 
We've certainly had interesting but not yet really productive discussions with UBC and SFU and UVic about uh, collaborative digitization. Um, some of that has been a bit challenging. I mean, you can't really talk about digitization programs for monographs in BC without facing up to the fact that UBC has 80% of the content, by and large. So, you know, it's sort of, a, you know, what, what can others bring to the table? Um, so, you know, I think that, I, I think that there are opportunities with our, the city archives in Vancouver and the library to do some strategic collaboration. I understand totally that the organizations have very different mandates, and, so, and, and we're not talking about, mer it's not like Library Archives Canada where it becomes one. That would never work given the, the legislative mandates that the two organizations have. Um, but that there also is a significant percentage of service which does overlap and where there are perhaps opportunities for more, a more strategic approach. And I think my approach has always been on some of these issues, you have to take the initiative because if you don't, you're going to be forced to do it at a time you don't want to and in a way you don't want to. You know, I think the imperative on us is to be able to demonstrate that we are operating efficiently and effectively. I use, I'm, you know, I get along well with Alex Youngberg, who's the president of QP391 in Vancouver. And we just are, Vancouver is still going through a huge um, issue with respect to shared services, which is to say shared services is the notion of across departmental silos uh, driving um, sort of more, more coordinated uh, service delivery and uh, also very aggressively seeking efficiencies. And this is where this whole thing about the archives and, and the library in the city first came up. But what I said to Alex was, I don't, I don't think she agreed with me necessarily, but we went through a really divisive battle at VPL in 2005 when we closed our in-house bindery. Um, no job loss, we had 5.5 FTE employees, nobody lost their job. Um, and uh, it was a battle royal, and it came down, it was a one vote difference on the board in the final decision on closing the bindery. One of the last left in the library in North America. UBC closed it, and then it's in the 1970s, right? The, the volume of, so we were binding to meet capacity, not to meet need. Um, and um, I said to Alex, look, Alex, if we hadn't done that in 2005, and then ended up in this, efficiency, you know, with Sierra Systems brought in as the outside consultant to do analysis of where there are efficiencies to be had and so on. If the bindery was still sitting there at that point, we would have, been, you know, it would just have undermined our credibility. Uh, and we would have been, I want to say dead in the water is too strong a word, but you need to be seen to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And I think there is an imperative that says we have to function as efficiently as we feel we can do without undermining our, our, our core service mandate. We need to wrap up, yep. uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, Aaron, uh, thank you. Further questions, and maybe we can we have some time for some one-on-one -on -one questions. So. Sure, I'm happy to, to talk with folks um, as we slowly clear the room. All right, all right, thanks. Okay, thank you all for coming. <laughs>